Okay, good afternoon and good morning. Um, thank you for joining us today on Wednesday um, for our presentation of Find Your Path to Cloud. We kind of call it the Encore Edition. We did a similar presentation about a year ago at one of the Oracle user groups. So we've updated the content with some information relevant for 2019, 2020. Hopefully uh, this is applicable for you folks. We'll just kind of jump right in here. Okay, so before we get started with the actual with, with the content for this session, just want to kind of throw a fast slide up here for you folks to let you know um, that um, we're doing a webinar series um, of different topics. Um, we're going to try to do at least once a month for the next three or four months different topics. We're always open to suggestions. We work with anything and everything technology based. So if you ever have any suggested topics or information you want to hear about, by all means, please feel free to send that over to us, and we'll be happy to add it to our list of content. So for this afternoon and this morning session, depending upon where you're located, we're going to run through a handful of topics. Um, and I'll kind of run through, again, I appreciate you folks being uh, on a live Zoom for this at this point in time. It's a bit different. We normally do these things in front of a live audience, so bear with me. You know, we have some pictures here and there. We'll work those pretty fast. We are recording this presentation, so after the recording of the presentation, if you attended or even if you missed it, or your staff has missed it, we can send you folks out a link. You can download the actual um, uh, PowerPoint slides themselves and or the full audio content, okay? So today, as we dive right into the topics, we're going to run through fast introductions um, and then instead of talk about at a very high level, some of the benefits of moving to the cloud, okay? We'll describe what cloud services are. Uh, we'll talk about things about how cost effective is cloud or how can you figure out if cloud is something which your organization can, can afford or not afford. Um, and then we'll discuss um, some of the techniques and tools we use at a, a daily basis here to help our customers create their own roadmaps to the cloud. Um, we'll discuss at a high level upgrading on-premise software, no matter what that tool happens to be. Um, and then we do have a little shout out for Oracle Cloud since we are an Oracle partner. Um, and I've personally worked with them for, for my lifetime basically. So I wanna kind of mention some of, the, some of the points about Oracle Cloud and then run through some fast Q&A for you folks. During the course of the session today, you're always welcome to add any questions you guys have to the actual Q&A panel. You should see that in your Zoom conference meeting. Um, we'll, we'll kind of monitor that as we're, as we're talking and discussing the different topics today. And as we do run through some of these topics, if the question is relevant for the material I'm showing on that slide, I'll try to answer it. Worst case, at the end of the session today, we'll have some time for Q&A. So jumping right in, uh, who am I? Just a fast introduction. I think I know most of the folks who have signed up for this presentation. Uh, if I don't, then um, nice to virtually meet you folks. Uh, my name is Joe Malawicki. I'm the founder and president of Arc Solutions. Um, I've been working with technology and infrastructure for over 23 years now. Uh, I am a certified cloud architect for Oracle, uh, as uh, well as um, a social architect for different platforms outside of Oracle. Um, I've done hundreds of implementations over my career, won top speaker awards for different content over time, and have done dozens and dozens of on-prem to cloud migrations. Um, so for the next 45 minutes, so talking basically, I'm gonna run some content, hopefully I can answer some questions for you folks and sort of keep the process going here. So first little laugh and joke, I wanna do a fast shout out here. Um, some of you may be wondering why we actually have this um, sort of theme of find your path, hiking and whatnot. Uh, a year ago, when we did a first iterations presentation, was at a, at a user conference in Seattle. We did a hiking theme, so I had to get my hiking gear on for that presentation. And of course, in the background, my kids had to surprise me with a birthday present of basically a little mannequin of myself, a bobblehead. So, about about our solutions at a very high level. Um, we are a full services consulting services firm. Um, we work with cloud infrastructure um, from Oracle, Azure, AWS. We specialize in um, Hyperion and VA infrastructure as well as full cloud system migration. So we're not limited on Hyperion, we work with every different realm there is for infrastructure and cloud migrations. We do soup the nuts as far as infrastructure and technology solutions um, from small business to three, four, five um, person shops up to enterprise wide corporate deployments. Okay, we are a certified um, Oracle Cloud Partner, it used to be called Gold Partner, now it's called Cloud Partner. Um, and we've been doing this, like I mentioned before, for literally for 23 years in my case, but the staff and our team right now of engineers, we have tens and tens of decades of experience, way too many to count. We all used to have hair back then. Uh, we do have um, offices in Connecticut, Mass, Indianapolis, and um, all, Indiana, sorry, Indiana and Rhode Island. Some, some clients we've worked with over the years. Again, this is a small snippet of customers here. Um, our client logo page is a lot larger than this, but there's some pretty diverse names on here we wanna kind of call out to you folks if you have any concerns or questions about 
industries we work in, the faster or not. Um, at the end of the day, for, for my firm and our firm, we're about relationships. Um, Technology is uh, something that's a commodity nowadays. With consultants, we build relationships. Um, we're proud to tell that we have a 100% re-sign rate every customer we work with from day one. Some of our service offerings um, from, from high realms, we do advisory services, cloud solutions, infrastructure, data governance, so on, so on. Um, the point behind this is we focus on cloud technology and infrastructure for customers. So anything you have on the table, um, again, whether it be migrations um, or just roadmap and advisory services, we wanna be your partner in that realm, okay? So enough about us, we've been around for a long time, a lot of work, I wanna get right into the content of this presentation right now. So if we sort of dive right in here, Let's take a minute and talk about why you folks might be here. Okay, um, this was a marketed um, session. It is a free session. As I mentioned, we'll keep doing these things all summer long and then on. Um, but some of the key themes about why customers or clients or folks attending sessions are, they're getting some, some pushback internally from IT departments or possibly management about moving towards the cloud, right? It could be an internal push or it could even possibly be, even be an external push, meaning your software vendor you're working with, so you may Microsoft with an operating system end of life, or maybe a third party tool where they're no longer supporting on-premise. So a lot of rhymes and reasons as to why you might be here today. And again, we're hoping to sort of cover some of those things in this presentation. Um, the ideal audience for this presentation is honestly, anybody who's interested in getting a better understanding of what this cloud stuff is all about, okay? Um, this is supposed to be educational, not sales oriented. So again, I do encourage questions um, and also, you probably noticed I talk very quick, okay, for a lot of reasons. One, a lot of content, and two, I'm from Northeast, and this is kind of how we roll up here. So if you miss something, just yell, raise your hand, whatever question I can repeat myself. Worst case afterward, you'll have my information, contact details, give me a shout, we can talk through things in person if you want to. <clears throat> so let's start out with a quick little 30-second poll, okay? Um, I want to kind of level set and kind of show for, you know, for the audience tonight today, really what is your biggest concern about moving to the cloud? Or if you're not actually in the cloud or in progress of the cloud or, or not an actual key decision maker for the cloud, what's, what's your, what do you think is the biggest concern most organizations have about moving to the cloud? So I'm going to launch a fast poll, which you guys should be able to see in your screens there. Let me know if that comes up or not. And then we have about 35, 40 seconds if you want to take a fast look at it and just kind of vote within Zoom there. And then we'll display the results. We'll give another five, six seconds. And then we'll sort of put those answers up on the board, kind of share them with the group here. Pretty interesting seeing some of the answers. This is pretty familiar. Okay. And let's go pop this out here. Okay, so let's share the results. And you folks should actually be able to see this. So the biggest um, concern, if you will, um, sort of across the board from those who voted was the concern about there's too many security risks or is my data gonna be safe? And this actually, it's, it's, it's ironic, it's actually a very, very real concern. Uh, it's a concern that we hear from every customer we speak to when they think about going to the cloud, whether it's, a, again, a small business, large enterprise or across the board. So um, kind of interesting. One which nobody stuttered today, which is very strange from about a year ago. A year ago, we did the same poll at the conference, and we had a bunch of folks chose the last option, which is a concern about losing my job. A lot of folks in IT are worried about that. So this is good information. I appreciate you guys sharing this, and we'll kind of talk through some of the, uh, these points and topics in the course of this next presentation. So the cloud, it's here to stay. Uh, Left-hand side, you see this picture, an old school mainframe data center. Right-hand side, it's a uh, high-tech state-of-the-art data center. Um, ironically enough, if you think about something, a computing cloud, if you will, is just someone else's computer. And, and it's sort of funny in our IT industry, how we've gone full circle from mainframe, which is centralized computing, to desktop computing, now back to mainframes again, or IE cloud services. A few interesting stats that I think it's worth sharing with you folks. Um, so we, we've seen over the course of time cloud trends and how they've improved. And I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but basically, um, you know, the dollars um, are really what's driving the cloud industry. Okay, every company and their uncle is considering moving to the cloud for some reason, good, bad, or ugly. Um, so along with that, you have a lot of service providers 
hardware providers and software providers out there trying to pave the way to give them the right kind of services. Okay, so if you take a fast look at a couple of these stats up here, you know, basically estimated in this coming, this, this fiscal account year, I should say, they're looking to exceed $330 billion um, in actual, you know, cloud marketing, computing revenue generated across the globe, okay? Uh, in 2018, the last year of my presentation, I gave the stat, 73% of organizations surveyed by IDG cloud computing sources um, claimed at least one application was running completely in the cloud. This year, I'm sorry, last year, I should say, that rose to 90%. That's a pretty massive thing. It means 90% of organizations surveyed are running something in the cloud, okay? Um, along with that, data centers and cloud processing have just blown up over time. You can see here, 2018, 45% of workloads, and I'll mention what a workload is a little bit here, were being processed or running in some kind of cloud provider, right? 2019, up to 60%, upwards trending. And by, these, by this direction and by this, this um, analysis, we're looking at almost 100%, 94% by the end of next year, we'll be processing data centers, um, we'll be, I'm sorry, cloud data centers will be processing workloads for customers, okay? Um, the US is undisputedly the champion as far as opening the wallet up for cloud spending, right? Um, in 2019, depending on who you ask and look at, your upwards of $125 billion was spent in 2019 by the United States. The next four highest countries, don't come up and add up to that. The next four highest countries are China, the UK, Germany, Japan. And those only total about $50 billion spent. So we are more than two times the annual spend revenue on cloud market in this country alone. So pretty interesting stats to kind of make you open your eyes a bit and see um, what's sort of trending and why people are looking at cloud more and more. So benefits of moving to the cloud. Um, this slide that kind of hits home with really, um, I like to say the last 10 years or the first 10 years, if you will, of true cloud technology and infrastructure is when it really, kind of really was born about 10 years ago now. Um, it's been kind of like training, right? And the reality is a lot of vendors grew up in that space. Um, and some of them, of course, still hold the market share, Amazon, for example, okay? But um, it truly has been the last eight, nine, 10 years of ramping up now. And now it's time to get hit the trail, so to speak. Um, benefits of, of cloud computing, and I think it's important to understand what cloud computing is a little bit, and we'll describe that in a couple of seconds here. But at a very high level, um, Cloud computing or benefits of cloud computing services um, could be for smaller mid-sized businesses or even large enterprise class organizations. Um, the benefits truly are endless. Um, it serves up a, uh, it provides a, a, a business um, time and money saving um, way to, to increase productivity, improve collaboration, and also promote innovation. Um, through a handful of, of sort of standard business practices, but streamlined for more efficiencies, if you will. Um, today, organizations have just, you know, piles and piles of data. Um, you have information on-prem, information which has been archived, sitting out there, historicals. So unless you're brand, brand new to any kind of industry, been around for a little time, you have a lot of data. Um, and over time, data tends to grow, it gets stale, right? Um, it sits out there. How do you maintain, manage that thing? Well, one of the big benefits of moving to the cloud is that it allows the opportunity to do this cleanup, if you will. Right, where you can take those disconnects between your infrastructure applications and you can sort of re-streamline that process and say, we have to keep this data archived historicals, yet we want to make sure we have a path going forward so we can actually take that information, use it in a process in an efficient manner. manner. Um, businesses use cloud computing resources to access information anywhere, um, meaning with compatible devices, as long as you have an internet connection, whether it's in your office um, securely or whether it's remote securely, Okay, you know, businesses and people have access to information. So the idea of storing something sitting in a server in an office or a data center, it's becoming sort of a, a thing of the past, if you will, because now we're not tied down to a physical location like we used to be. We have the internet, we have improved bandwidth, improved connectivity. Okay, so the idea is with cloud computing, you know, allow access to this information from, from wherever you need to be securely. Okay, there's a big price equals performance a metric involved when you talk about benefits of moving to the cloud, meaning the more you pay, typically, the more you get with cloud infrastructure, um, as opposed to legacy technology, um, where you know you pay a boatload of money for a, 
set of servers or, or resources or solutions and it sit around and grow and grow and grow over time and get older and older and older well on occasion you may and might need to improve your performance and, and boost up some of your resources for some computing tasks well that ability is there with cloud it's not there with on-prem without making another monetary large investment um, cloud is more secure than on-premise and we're actually going to do a whole presentation coming up just on security and cloud offering this is a very very hot topic as you saw from our survey in the beginning but but um trust when i say that sec security and cloud is a lot higher than most organizations have um, in-house today um, proprietary data information you know uh, confidential details those types of things people think i don't, don't want to move the cloud my financials because it's out there on the internet well the reality is when you move things to the cloud you are isolated you're in your space you have you have ways of, of isolating yourself. And because these firms that are hosting that, that cloud infrastructure are more scrutinized than ever be, you are likely more protected um, you know, by moving things to the cloud if you do it the right way. Um, as I mentioned, cost reduction, this is one which is a hit or miss. Um, cost reduction of moving to the cloud, typically it's there when you move resources to some kind of a cloud provider. Um, but my big point for this one is when you talk about information technology, and services solutions, the majority of folks, when they're uh, not an accountant, so laugh at me here, the majority of folks look at, um, at, these, at these expenditures as capital expenditures, CapEx, okay? When you move to the cloud, it's not operating expenses, okay? Which means you can take these things, your annual subscriptions, your month subscriptions, and you can run them off annually for taxes. You don't have to have this thing spread out so you can't take the full tax benefit up front. So there actually is a cost reduction um, on the bottom line taxes, as well as how you report the information moving to the cloud, okay? Um, as always, see your account for more details. Um, so the last two big points of moving to the cloud, the, the, the big benefit I want to kind of get to here is we're now in this what's called a second generation, right? We're in decade two. So all the lessons learned from the first five, 10 years of cloud computing, they're now you know, learned, consumed, processed, evaluated. So every vendor provider, whether it's Amazon, Azure, Oracle, Google, or, or you name it, they're taking the lessons learned, they're growing their business exponentially, more efficient and more productive on the backend infrastructure, which is a benefit for all of us as consumers. So cloud computing in general, as I mentioned, it really is just doing the work someplace else. That's what it comes down to. Um, it's still your work. It's still your business process. It's still your, your, your software in a lot of cases. Um, you're just doing that someplace else. You're using somebody else's horsepower, if you will, to get your job done. Um, cloud computing, it gives users access to data, again, wherever you have internet connection or, or, or viability to get to that particular system. Um, small business owners again especially this is a problem for a lot of small business owners you know and again i'm a small business owner so i understand this very very intimately um we invest in hardware and software well when the hardware software breaks we have an issue something goes wrong with it we have to go to backups well we're not we're not tuned and designed for say uh, an in-house backup server if i have eight nine engineers across the country so cloud computing is a great tool that we can use and we leverage to sort of handle our sort of um shared computing tasks if you will um, there's a, the cloud computing itself is basically it's an umbrella term and really what it encompasses um, is describing a, a series of different types of cloud services and solutions, things like compute networking, meaning how many processors and how much memory and how, how many networks am I, am I, you know, standing up and how are those provisioned um, storage, how much storage am I, you know, allocated, am I paying for high bandwidth storage, am I paying for lower storage for archiving purposes. Um, backup solutions, PaaS and SaaS solutions, hosting. So it's a computing by itself, cloud computing, it's a general catch-all term for really anything being hosted or served by somebody else that you can subscribe to in some manner, is how I look at things. There's a, hand, a handful of standard cloud services. We're going to discuss uh, briefly the SaaS, PaaS, and IaaS services in a little more detail, just to kind of give you guys some definitions as far as what these services are and sort of, you know, how they relate to what's in front of you today for cloud providers and offerings, okay? And um, we're gonna start with my favorite because I am infrastructure um, with a service known as Infrastructure as a Service or IaaS, okay? Um, think of this as the next generation of on-prem data centers and hardware. Okay, for basically your business needs. So if you're a small mom and pop shop and accounting firm, you may have a server or two sit in your office, right? Storing all your all your data and records and whatnot. If you're a large enterprise organization, you know, globally dispersed, um, think of this as your data centers in two, three, four, five regions across the globe, 
right? But end of the day, um, what this is, it's, it's, it's using someone else's data center and their hardware for your applications. And you subscribe to that, meaning you say, I want a chunk. I want some network. I want some memory. I want some storage. I want some compute power, right? That's infrastructure as a service. Um, the, the big players in this market are, of course, you know, the top dog still just by simply just sheer, you know, volume and time. It's Amazon Web Services, AWS, um, with Azure as well. And um, I do put an Oracle Cloud infrastructure in there because Oracle, believe it or not, is actually is one of the top 10 uh, and growing very, very fast. And actually, it's one of the most, um, I want to say, cutting edge IS providers out there today. And we'll discuss that more later on what that means. But the key is infrastructure as a service or IaaS. It's sort of, as you see in this picture, bundling together, you know, the three core foundations, servers and storage, networking, and as well as the actual physical data center. And we subscribe to that with parts and pieces we want to use. Um, it might be funny for you to, to, to realize this, but 80% of migrations to basically what's called a public cloud are infrastructure migrations, meaning like for like. So I have a server or two servers in my office if you will, or my organization, or 50 or 100, I want to move them as they are, lift and shift, no changes, up to the cloud. And that, that does compromise more than three quarters of migrations to the cloud today for infrastructure as a service. Um, and the reason for that is, as I briefly mentioned, you had this model of, you know, pay for what you use. It's elastic. I could scale up and down if I want to. I can say I, I need to have Maybe you're a, you know, an engineering firm and you're rendering some kind of 3D models, okay, for you know, within CAD or, or some kind of third-party proprietary software you have. And you have to go out there and every year upgrade your workstations for your designers and engineers. Well, you could leverage the computing power, you know, literally, you know, with a click of a switch, so to speak, and a push of a button where you can scale up and render, you know, your particular applications or, or your final product, you know, very, very quickly using cloud computing resources. And when you're done, you scale it back down again. So you're not paying for it to sit there idle, you know, three quarters of the time, you know, over the course of, of a year. Or if you're in a finance um, organization and possibly use some consolidation reporting tools or aggregation tools, um, or even relational tools for that matter, you definitely have periods which are known periods to you. You know you have month end closes, quarter end closes, annual closes, where you need a lot more horsepower to get that work done in a lot, a lot more efficient and faster manner. Well, with um, infra as a service, you didn't have the ability a lot of times to use elastic resources, meaning I can simply go out there, scale up as I need to, and crank up my CPUs and my horsepower, do my process, do my close, scale it back down again, possibly even turn it off, mothball it for a few weeks. So next close if you want to. And I stop paying for the most part for those resources. So um, elastic computing, um, it's a very, very big feature of, of um, IaaS hosted or IaaS providers, okay, today. Um, IaaS providers are also very easy to use typically. They've come a long way in the last 10 years. We're managing and maintaining these things. You can simply get in the console, have some automated scripts so that during these high peak usage times, you truly can fire these things up and down, even automate or lights out if you had to. Oops, wrong way here. Okay. Um, platform as a service. This is, I want to say it's fairly new, but it's probably the newer, newer-ish, if you will, um, cloud computing um, services and solutions. Platform as a service is basically taking your existing IS pieces, your hardware, your network, your storage, your, your data center and whatnot, and adding on there now things like operating systems or possibly some proprietary items like databases um, or, or third-party applications. In other words, not so much subscription-based in terms of individual users. Um, most of the time, platform as a service means you're sort of lumping together processes. The, the best example for a lot of folks is databases. Um, obviously, from Oracle's perspective, they're talking about database, um, as they call it. It's it's uh, you know it's a PaaS based service, right? Um, Microsoft Azure has their SQL Server service, um, SQL Server as a service, and of course you have um, Amazon's building up their RDS platform. So so platform as a service means basically taking some kind of tool or solution and building on top of this IS infrastructure and kind of selling access to it that way, as opposed to saying, hey, here's my Office 365. You know, um, you know, desktop version of Excel, it's saying, no, here's an access to my Oracle database through a URL or a link. Okay, nothing to worry about beyond that. 
software as a service is the other big gun. And this is the one which typically from most people's perspectives, um, it's seen and used um, um, very, very frequently, whether you realize it or not. Um, software as a service was probably the original, if you will, push for cloud services. Okay, um, uh, some firms we had a very long time ago, we had some options. I can sell licenses for software or I can sell access like subscription, almost like lease or buy, right? You, you buy, if you buy a, buy a software license for a version of Microsoft Office, as an example, you're going to spend your couple hundred bucks if you're a business user, got a license and you have it and it's good for a year, right? You know, updates are typically out there as long as they want to give them to you. You're not going to get new features and new upgrades and whatnot. It's a one and done. You kind of buy it and you kind of live with it forever. Um, SaaS-based versions of software would be things like Office 365, where you subscribe to a very, very low monthly rate per user to get access to it. And along with that, as long as you're paying, you're going to get access to the most current updates, features, versions, and so on. So it's a lower cost up front. However, over time, let's face it, like leasing a car, they make their money, right? Um, the majority of software vendors today, this is the end game, okay? That's the goal. It's software to service licenses because let's put it out there. That's the money maker, right? You can get a lot more money over two or three years of constant paying versus upfront one time hit, right? Um, because it is a recurring fee use. Um, software as a service is also what's called multi tenant, which means you don't know if you're sitting on a server that has 10,000 or users on it or not. Um, most software as a service products, they're, they're written that way. Um, to handle multi tenancy to so you are secure as far as your information is concerned but you're on shared hardware shared resources again things like uh, oracle's epm cloud office 365 google apps cisco you know webex zoom for example are all um, examples of SaaS. Um, what is important to call out is what SaaS applications are not and this is more from the business perspective as opposed to some of the smaller business or enterprise class businesses. Um, SaaS applications, they're written to be software as a service as it describes, okay? So they're, they're not written for proprietary use, single use, or multi-tenant high scalable use. Office 365 version of Excel is not the same thing as desktop version of Excel if you bought by yourself. Just like the EPM planning cloud is not the same thing as on-premise planning, okay? Um, so it's just to kind of keep in the back of your mind when people say, oh, it's a piece of it's SaaS software. You have to look at it and say a lot of times, you know, is it truly SaaS meaning it's written from the ground up and, and, and that's the way it's supposed to be for shared tenancy in the cloud or was it an on-prem tool that they rewritten or ported over to be a quote, quote SaaS. So SaaS tools are designed to be very, very efficient with their server resources. Um, they scale very, very um, well as well for these providers, okay? Um, as I mentioned in the last slide, revenue for SaaS applications does not come from single large licenses. It comes from the concept of many to one ratio, smaller licenses, longer recurring terms. All right, so let's take a couple seconds here and sort of just dive into a bit about, you know, can you afford the cloud or not? Um, this is a question we get all the time. Um, once we get past the, is my data safe in the cloud question? The next question is, oh my gosh, it's so expensive. I can't afford this. How can I do this? Um, and we're going to talk about this from the approach of the what's called the uh, infrastructure as a service or IaaS approach. Meaning going from on-premise today up to some kind of a cloud provider. Um, the cost of cloud computing can vary greatly, right? It, it depends on, on, on a lot of variables and a lot of factors. Right, you know what you want to do, um, type of cloud services you need, type of uptime, type of availability, type of isolation security. Um, so to give you some for instance here, you know, let's we'll talk cloud storage and file sharing. So you have things like Dropbox, which I'm sure a lot of you folks have heard of before. Well, Dropbox, you can get out there um, and you can start with a free account. You get whatever they're given these days. I can't recall what it is, um, but you know, X amount of gigabytes um, or terabytes, if you will. Um, a month, that's the space you get, right, for free account. Um, you can use that up, even Apple iCloud, same thing, right? As soon as you get to that point where you're hitting that threshold, they want to start upselling you to the next level. Not all you have to do is slap in a credit card, and then voila, magically your account's upgraded. That's the joy of cloud, right? You didn't change anything that would give them some more money. It's subscription. They modify your license, and now you have access to more space and capacity. So 
again, from a drop down Dropbox perspective, you start free, you know, but then basically you're beginning at $20 a month once you start to get some of their advanced features and more costing, right? Per user. And that's the key per user. Um, so other services, things like maybe cloud backup solutions like Carbonite, which is like a third party, one of the industry leading um, backup providers today for software, you know, they're about 60 bucks a month per user starting. Now you're not going to find a Fortune 500 company spending $20 a month per license for Dropbox or $60 a month for Carbonite. They're going to spend tens of thousands of dollars a month to get subscriptions for enterprise versions of those tools. However, they're the exact same tools, right? It's just a matter of what their licenses look like. There's nothing different under the hood, typically as far as technology is concerned. Um, when you talk about infrastructure and, and, and its affordability and how that works, infrastructure as a service is normally based on the pay-as-you-go model. Now, that aside, of course, you could subscribe and you can say, I want to go give a million dollars a year to, to Oracle. You know, what can I get for that? Well, here's your bucket of time. They call them credits in Oracle, for example. And you consume those credits and you pay a million bucks once a year and voila, life is good. However, you could also be like we are, a much smaller shop, and we do a pay-as-you-go model. And we pay month to month for credits instead. Okay, so the exact same services that, you know, um, if, if you're out there working for Zoom, for example, and just in case you haven't heard, Zoom actually, this conference right now webinar is hosted. Well, Zoom runs all their stuff on Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, OCI, their hosting services um, and their IS services. They're paying a lot more non paying per month, right? Um, but again, technology under the hood, I have access to the same things as a, as a smaller player. Um, Cloud-based software pricing also depends on, on the actual provider you're working with, okay? So um, keep in mind, everyone has their own metric, their own model. I listed out on this page here a few of these standard, um, the three main providers we're talking about today, which is Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, um, Microsoft Azure and Web Services, and Amazon. Um, all three of them have what's great, they're called calculators. So you could literally go out there and plug in how much CPU, memory, and parts and pieces you want, and you can get some pretty accurate estimates before you even pull a trigger and buy anything at all. Um, also, all of them, um, all three of these, as well as Google and a bunch of other ones out there, offer free trials. So you can play around if you want to and sort of get your hands wet without actually paying anything. Okay. Now, being a smaller business, I want to kind of show how all this translates down. Now, again, keep in mind, this is for a you know small firm. We're eight engineers okay, um, here across, across the states. But I just want to kind of show you folks, if you put out in really small terms, right? And, and, and this can basically be scaled up to any software and tool and solution you folks have in your organizations, big or small, you can sort of see how things work out here, right? Um, on the left-hand column, I have basically what we're paying today, okay? for our annual cloud costs for these products. On the right-hand column, you're saying what we'd be paying if we had on-premise versions of some of these same parts and pieces. Again, just a very high level, just to give you an idea of sort of how things work here, right? Um, you know, if we start with the office apps, which is basically desktop, like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, plus email, and those things, you know, I'm paying around 750, give or take a year for our hosted Office 365 exchange, right? If I had to get estimated on-premise licenses for that same software, um, I'm almost double that price, right? Um, you know, same thing. If I look at my QuickBooks, which is our time entry system that we use here in a very, very small scale, I'm paying about two, four, two fifty a year. If I had to buy that software for a couple of users, eight hundred bucks a year. And I scale this up to ten users, fifty users, a hundred users, a thousand users, right? For getting discounts, which are always there, I understand that. Um, you can see how the numbers sort of scale here. This truly can add up, okay? As far as your annual software licenses. Now, maybe I'm paying you know, 4,400 bucks a year, give or take, okay? Um, I'll actually just back that out. I'm paying about, about, about $2,000 a year for my software licenses. Well, over three years, I'm gonna be paying more as a cloud subscriber, as opposed to an on-prem license person. However, I also have to think about my versions. Do they get old, do they expire, to buy new versions, okay? So the cycle does continue, and over the course of three to five, seven years, you're gonna see with license and renewal and hardware upgrades, things almost wash out in the end if we start running numbers over time. Um, the benefit again to me is I can take in everything in that annual cloud cost column, write that off every year for taxes, don't have to worry about my depreciation or my expenditures being too large and, and having them carved up over a course two or three years to write them all off. So I get that benefit every year from the bottom line coming out. Um, the one big one I want to point out is that very bottom line, it says POC lab environments. 
Um, we actually hear our solutions because we do work and we are certified to work with all three of the major providers you see there, OCI, Azure, and AWS. Um, we have engineers um, certified on all platforms at our organization here and work with them daily. We have um, a basically demo or sandbox environments, playgrounds, if you will, on each of those providers. So we're paying roughly about two grand a year for those, a little, little less than that for those three providers. If I had to buy the hardware equivalent and store that someplace, forgetting my internet connection, forgetting my data center overhead and costs and whatnot too, I'm looking at, you know, basically, you know, almost six, seven times that, almost 13 grand, okay? To, for the first year to buy that hardware. And year two, that hardware is now a year old. Year three, it's two years old. Year four, hardware is obsolete, right? Now I'm gonna do, I gotta buy it again, another 13, 14 grand, okay? So, that's where the infrastructure as a service cost effectiveness really comes in. Once your, your systems are upgraded and out onto that cloud, you can very easily port them and move them to the newer hardware as those generations come out. Okay. So let's take a few minutes here and kind of talk about how, how we get there. Where, where do we go from here? We've kind of mentioned the background about what some of these cloud services are um, and how they work. And I want to kind of share with you a few of the parts and pieces of what we do daily for customers, um, so for customers as we help our own clients move to the cloud. Step one is build a migration plan, okay? And you have to have a place to start. So I always recommend my customers think about things two to three years out, which is difficult. I mean, especially with this past springtime and what we're still sort of going through right now, no one saw this thing coming by a long shot, right? No, we did. And if we look at, well, how do you plan for this? What do we do to, to, to handle this? And by the way, we're going to do a session just on sort of this, not disaster recovery, but this concept of managing infrastructure and in uncertain times that's coming up as well as one of our topics. But, but if we look at what happened this past, you know, two or three years out, we would be thinking about, well, okay, if I forget about catastrophes, I know that I'm going to grow my employee base by 15%, 20%. Okay. Um, I know that I want to introduce three or four new products. Right. So I want to think about what does that translate into as far as the business requirements and ultimately into infrastructure needs. Okay. It's the first thing to do is think about two to three years out. And again, you're just guessing at this point. You have to think about what kinds of systems have to remain on premise, meaning it'd be great if I can move one piece of the puzzle to the cloud, but I can't move these pieces or I don't want to move these pieces. Maybe it's proprietary engineering software. Maybe it's my financial actuals. If I don't want to move them, but budget's okay. So think about what parts and pieces will be okay with moving to the cloud. And right now I'm not comfortable enough yet. And of course, then you have to think about monetary considerations and policy requirements, right? Um, a lot of C-levels and companies across the globe are pushing for cloud infrastructure for a lot of different reasons, right? So as your new policies coming down the pike, I have to contend with, you know, I have to watch out for, or we do a lot of work for also government agencies. Is there governance or compliance issues? Meaning I can't move this out. It's a government, it's a whatever. You know, it's a FedRAM kind of a situation where I can't move these pieces to the cloud. So luckily there are solutions for those today as well, but for the most part, it's a little scarier doing those parts and pieces, okay? Um, so these are all bits and pieces of things you have to think about as you're beginning to build your roadmap. Um, the goal is to not forget. Um, you know, the goal here is to get the people, processes, and the tools more efficient without wasting money on resources, okay, or fundamental foundation components, okay, that are going to prohibit you from basically focusing on the, the business growth in the organization. Um, if we drill into this, you know, the goals to me, it's that magic wish list of things that I always tell my customers, think about this open slate. It's what I don't like today, right? Um, what I wish I could have done yesterday. How come I can't do this right now, right? Um, and that's how I tell my customers, think about your goals. Decide what those bits and pieces are first, because that's your immediate business benefit. If you say, well, I can't close my books in less than two days every single month because it's too slow. That's a big problem right there. So my goal would be, man, get that process cut in, in half or a quarter of the time. How do I do that now? Okay. Um, so that's sort of how you have to start. Build your, build your goals around your wish list. And then as you start building those goals, then you can start seeing how you can apply those goals and what parts and pieces of cloud infrastructure or service and solution offerings are applicable towards those goals. You know, a lot of firms start with one system, one small system, move it up there move it someplace, move it to Oracle, move it to Azure, AWS, wherever, okay? Um, relaunch in a SaaS tool, figure it out, get your feet wet, right? Start to get the ins and outs and then move to the next system. 
um, we do something which is called a cloud services questionnaire that we have. And, and by the way, um, you can't see the screen here, but I'll be happy to send me an email to send you over a questionnaire just you can have it for your own purposes. I don't need it back once you want to share it and talk through it, but we'll give it to you. It has a million questions on there. Things like business, you know, direction, you know, cloud strategies, IT development initiatives, these types of things. And it's just a bunch of handful of questions, dozens of questions that begin the process of getting you thinking about your roadmap and what you have to include on this process for your, your cloud strategy. Okay. So it's a very, very important one. Develop your own questionnaire, use ours, go to the internet, but figure out the list of things you have to ask yourself and your organization as you're building your roadmap out. And all this stuff gets compiled back together when you ultimately build your migration strategy and plan. Okay. Um, just as crucial as your wish list and goals, um, and your questionnaires, if you will. Um, in my mind, being the hands-on tech person, this is where we get nitty gritty with things. Um, perform an inventory of what you have today. You're talking about software as well as hardware. Every piece of software you guys use in your organization today, how many users do you have? How much do you pay for that a month, a year, right? What do you pay for maintenance of that software for a year? I mean, these types of questions. Um, how old is that software? Is it being updated still? right? Hardware. How much hardware do I have? I have 15 servers. I have two servers. I have a thousand servers. What kind of servers? What kind of operating systems? Are they virtual, physical? The more granular you can get, the better you can be. Um, when we work with customers, we have a table similar to this, which we start with. And again, this is spreadsheet. I'll be happy to share with you folks. Um, where we list an application out, what it is, the different environments they have, you know, some notes about it, uh, memory, CPU, disk drive, OS, virtual not so on so on so on okay um, by doing this you can see in the bottom bottom of the screen under these columns in yellow you can see well if i add up my for example this customer's i pairing customer and there are four environments well i'm consuming about 36 cpu cores which is column three the very bottom right well that means when i go to my cloud provider i got to think about do i need to have 36 of these things do i need more of these things for growth less of them for consolidation right but i have to write it down someplace and start someplace first otherwise i'm not going to have any way of knowing where I'm going when I get to the cloud, okay? So create the spreadsheet, you know, use the pricing calculators I mentioned a few minutes ago, and you can even punch in these numbers of 36 cores, X amount of memory, X amount of disk, and you can get some rough estimates without calling Oracle or Amazon or Azure or getting spammed by telemarketers. And you can find out for yourself, you know, is it affordable or not when it comes to cloud infrastructure? So again, the key thing is, you know, Inventory, 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 get all your information, get your arc diagrams, your software inventory sheets, you know, try to keep all the information together. And this is going to help you build a really nice um, uh, list of my, here's my tangibles now for my roadmap or for my process for migration to the cloud. Okay. So once we have our inventory and we have our information, what next? Well, what's next is we have to figure out what is our model to get to the cloud. Um, and there's multiple ways of doing it, right? Um, at a very high level, you know, you're talking about either lift and shift approach, rebuilding net new, or possible, I'm sorry, you know, sorry, lift and shift approach, replacing software with a new software, which is called SaaS, um, or possibly developing brand new. Maybe it's like a PaaS database you're rebuilding in the cloud. Okay, so you're really gonna figure out for each tool you have listed out in your software, and your metric, and your system, which one of these buckets they fall into. And that's where you're gonna begin developing and really begin budgeting out your process of what you're looking at, okay? Um, there's a lot of keys, um, a lot of key areas that go into building roadmaps and, and migration plans to the cloud. I've kind of called out five of these things, these major ones on here, which we think about for every piece of our cloud deployment, no matter if it's a software or a re-engineered solution or a system which has to get migrated someplace. Um, you know, these, these five points, if you will, scalability, resiliency, security, app design and management monitoring, we look at every piece of the puzzle for every item a customer wants to migrate to the cloud or not migrate, and we say where they fit in the bucket here, okay? So these little five pointers on here, again, you can deep dive into all these things, but the, the point is every piece you're gonna move to the cloud, you should consider you know, these five points at the minimum. You know, how are you gonna get there? What are you gonna do? How are you gonna make them scalable, resilient, backup recovery, secure, and so on and so on, okay? Um, the big piece, that a lot of organizations miss when it comes to moving to the cloud. Um, it's the people behind the scenes. And that's why I asked that question earlier on about folks who are about losing their jobs. It's very common in IT 
um, the IT engineers and DevOps people and mock people are scared about cloud migrations because they fear for their jobs. Um, when the ironic part is me being an IT person, I embrace the cloud because the reality is one, it's fun, it's new, it's exciting. And two, there's so much more to learn. And three, your skill sets are transferable between providers. Okay. But at the end of the day, it's about the people. You're going to be impacting your end users or your business or possibly your customer or possibly your management or reporting people, right? So um, whatever you're doing, you're moving a system. You have to think about how it's going to impact those folks. It's going to be a cultural change, a process change. So consider all these things and how it works. That being said, don't be scared of the change, right? Everybody at one point had to go from, excuse me, if you're a Windows for work groups to Windows 95 to Windows 7, Windows 10. Okay. Everyone had to go from an old version of a Linux operating system to a more current one, right? So people have been out there for a long time doing this. Everything's changed. Everyone went from AOL, if you're that old like I am, to Gmail. We all did it. We all survived. So you can change. It's a matter of how you do that. So keep that in mind as you're putting in these cloud changes, you scale the stuff in, you move the stuff in, and you plan for the people and orders of changes and take care of those people. Okay. Um, two more points that I always want to throw out here, they don't need much explanation, but when we do roadmap to the cloud, a couple pieces that we want to make sure customers don't forget about is stop gap measures. As you're say, moving your first system, make sure you have plan B, how you roll back, what's your cutover plan going to look like when it comes, are you going to run parallel, what if something goes wrong? So these are common sense kinds of things. If you're an enterprise um, organization of any size for that matter, profit or non, always think about what's my stopgap measure, what's my, what's my plan, be my fallback point, so don't forget about that. Um, and this, this is an area which, don't laugh, we love. We love PMs when it comes to tracking progress. Um, cloud implementations should go very quick, a lot quicker than an on-premise implementation would go no matter what it is, regardless of the system or suite, it should go much faster. Um, you actually want it to go faster, the reason for that is cloud technology is changing as fast as you're deploying. So if you start something in August and don't go live until the following October, a year from then, right, there's a good chance your cloud infrastructure has changed. Has it actually happened to a, a very big pharma client of ours. They began with an old generation uh, of OCI. And by the time they went live, it was almost a year and a half later and things changed twice and, they, and it cost them a lot of heartache and headache. So, so monitor and track your progress as you're going through this. Use a standard project management model. Just stick with it, your timelines, and you kind of, you'll see over time how you can kind of keep yourself from sort of veering off. It also helps you to get your, your buy-in from, you know, from the government's aspect, governance aspect from the C-level ownership, right? If you can go to them every week and say, here's a project plan, you move this system this week, boom, here you go. It helps a lot, okay? Um, I mentioned this a minute ago about reaching the peak ASAP. The goal behind cloud adoption is sooner than later, okay? Because things do change so dramatically. The good thing is once you get out there, you're rolling forever. You don't have to worry about that, okay? So I wanna spend just a few minutes, not too much time, just chatting quickly about upgrading on-premise software. Um, and this stemmed from a lot of our sort of Oracle or Hyperion customers. And um, we took out the Hyperion specifics in this section, but it's applicable, I find, for any kind of software solution. The question always comes up is, should I upgrade my software or not, right? You know, is, is truly on-premise software dead? Is it going away? So I wanna throw a stat out here. And I had to look this up last week, and I couldn't believe when I saw it. Um, but in 2019, right, the global market was almost a half a trillion dollars spent, US dollars, okay, on market revenue was, was brought in by organizations for on-premise software alone. That's a massive number. That tells you right then and there, it's not going away tomorrow, okay? We're talking about, you know, $466 billion, you know, globally was spent on new software licenses or software licenses renewal last year. That's an amazing number. And along with that, you know, a little less than a quarter of that was for SaaS-based software, which tells you there's some money out here, which means what? These big software vendors, whether it be Microsoft or Oracle or whoever it is, right, they're not getting rid of on-prem software right away. It's going to have a little time to work on this stuff, okay? So don't freak out about, oh my gosh, I have to go to cloud next year or the year after. You have time to begin building your roadmap, right? Um, a lot of times, upgrading your current on-premise software, whatever that tool happens to be, doesn't make a difference, will save you some time because now you can analyze and say, wow, you know what? I can do a technical upgrade of my version of whatever software I'm running, okay? 
and I bought myself another year of support from whatever vendor I'm working from. And along with that, I'm staging myself to clean up my licenses, maybe reduce some costs and get myself ready for the cloud. So when I do when I make the jump at some point, I'm not going back from four or five, six years backwards. I'm going back from one year back or two versions back. Okay. So, so upgrading in my mind is always a key thing to do for any kind of infrastructure. You know, again, it kind of keeps the housekeeping, if you will, right? You're taking care of, taking care of what you're going to move before you move it. Like if you're moving to a new house across town or across state, if you just take all your crap you have in the current house, throw it in the store, can you move it over? You're going to be unpacking, you know, your old grandma's, you know, pictures from 1915 still. Well, do you really want those pictures? Yes. But do you want to have the mugs that with those pictures? Probably not. So do a little clean house as you're upgrading and that gets you prepared when it's time to move to the cloud. Um, so the last point about upgrading, I wanna just kind of call your attention here, um, is, is the idea of, is it, you know, can you afford not to upgrade, right? Um, we see this in our industry, literally week to week, we get calls from customers saying, oh my gosh, my version of Windows, my IT department is saying, um, they're cutting me off in two weeks or in a month or two months, what happens now? I'm on Windows 2008, which is killed by Microsoft last year. They gave me six, eight months. It's been 10 months now. They're ready to pull the trigger of what happens now. So we always suggest to all of our customers, keep on top of whatever software and tools you use, as well as whatever tools those software products integrate with, whether it be databases or operations or, or office apps or whatever, keep on top of the, the, the support lifetime policies for those vendors. I kind of threw out here, you know, two of the big ones that we work with all the time, which are Microsoft and Oracle. But no matter what the tool is you're using today, make sure whatever software provider you're buying that from, they're going to support that thing going forward and how long that support's going to last because that right then might push you into upgrading sooner than you might want to be. And the last thing you want to do is get caught behind the eight ball on that. Um, so keep, keep that in mind no matter what you're looking at. Keep on top of your, your, your um, software end of life policies, okay? Um, a little tangent on that along with software support tends to come technical support. And what we find in our industry is that the older a version gets, the harder it is to find good staff to support you. Okay. So it's just something you kind of want to keep your heads over, your heads open to, that you don't want to go out there and say, well, I'm running a version of whatever tool that's seven years old, and there's three people left in the company who support that, that, that particular product because they're around back then. That else is gone right now. So tech support to me is as much of an issue to, to be concerned with. Um, you know, uh, life cycle for software as it is, you know, the actual software itself. So as we're wrapping up a couple of the slides here, I did want to do just a two or three minute shout out just to kind of talk about Oracle Cloud for a minute. Um, I'm, I'm not giving a sales pitch for Oracle by any means, but I did want to call out two or three things regarding Oracle's cloud platform, only because I'm a little biased because I am a certified architect for Oracle, so I take pride in this stuff and know it pretty well. Um, <laughs> at a high level, Oracle Cloud, it's a, it's a truly is a comprehensive and state-of-the-art suite of applications and infrastructure, okay? Um, when Oracle builds a SaaS application or a software application, they're building it from the ground up, which is why it takes time sometimes. And we have a lot of slack in industry for being behind the eight ball on things. The reality is they're not building software you know, just ship out on the shelf, you know, you pay a hundred bucks down, and go. They're building enterprise class software. So any SaaS tools from Oracle are normally vetted, take a lot longer to kind of get the ball rolling on them because they are enterprise class built systems. Um, as far as their, their infrastructure is concerned, their services, they actually are one of the leaders as far as spinning up new data centers right now. Um, they're, they're popping up data centers faster than you can think right now. They've been building these things for years, which is wonderful. Um, you can kind of see on this map right here, there's 17 commercial data centers right now across the globe for Oracle's um, for global footprint infrastructure. Um, this time last year, I think it was 11 or 12. Okay, so they're popping these things like crazy right now, and they do have 11 more planned. Along with that is they're one of the very few providers that has a multinational FedRAMP certification. So you can actually get globally, you know, um, government-based systems can also be moved to data centers. And actually we're doing that right now for a couple organizations in, in uh, New York City actually right now. So it's pretty cool stuff. Um, we get a lot of questions a lot of times about, well, Oracle versus AWS. Since AWS, you know, let's face it, they are the granddaddy of, of as a service offerings. And sort of how does that compare? Well, um, this snapshot's from last year. I didn't get a chance to run new numbers this, um, this week, unfortunately. But you can see from last year's pricing, if you compare like to like, Oracle versus AWS, um, which is again, that's kind of called their big, you know, their big target competitor, if you will. 
Um, Oracle is a lot more aggressive on pricing and offers a lot better performance with the same dollar in AWS Fence right now. So again, don't, don't take it from me. This is just simply just, you know, passing information over from Oracle and their published documentation. Um, I can tell you personally, I've worked on all the platforms um, and we have demos running on all the platforms, if you will. So we, we kind of see our own stats internally and the Oracle infrastructure does tend to perform a lot better for a lot lower cost than AWS and even Azure for that matter. Um, as far as cloud infrastructure, again, Oracle is great about kind of, you know, let like mock AWS here and there. Um, on their website, they actually launched this this past week, a new calculator, which you can go out there and actually punch in, hey, here's my compute, my storage, and my network, and it will tell you Oracle's prices versus AWS's current prices, which is kind of, kind of interesting to look at that. So it's something you can check out if you want more details on that. So we're approaching top of the hour. So before we kind of close out here, just a really quick summary. Um, and again, I'm not going to read this whole slide to you folks. You're welcome to get this in the, in the, um, the media packet afterward, which we can email to you folks. Um, but there's a handful of things you want to consider when you're talking about, you know, um, moving to cloud offerings versus staying on premise offerings. Okay. And kind of highlighting some of these major points are the infrastructure, implementation time, investments, you know, software, so on, so on. Um, so this slide, it kind of summarized a lot of information I kind of threw at you guys in the last hour. Um, and, and to a nice little table for you to kind of, you know, wrap your head around and, and dig into a bit here. Um, but the overall point I want to get across was really that there is a way to get to the cloud, whether it's today, tomorrow, six months or a year from now, everyone's going that direction at some point it's happening, whether you, whether you want it or not. Um, and you can do it properly and cost effectively in smaller chunks, which are a lot more manageable. If you take time to really plan out your roadmap, and really inventory and think about what your needs are um, and then break those things into, into manageable pieces. Um, again, the same logic applies. It doesn't make a difference if you're a Fortune 100 company or if you're a firm my size, right? That doesn't employ us. It's the exact same model you're gonna follow. It's just a matter of sheer scale as you're doing it, okay? So I wanna kind of make sure you understand that there's a path for everyone out there. It's just a matter of finding that path and sort of fill in the blanks as you sort of go from there. So that being said, I talked a lot in the last hour. Um, are there any questions that anybody has? Um, feel free, you can post them in the chat if you want to, and we'll be happy to answer them that way anonymously. So don't worry, no one sees you asking questions. There are, are no dumb questions. Um, or if you're not comfortable and you want to email them to us afterward, um, I have my information, of course, in the slide deck, or, or Alicia, who is our ops director as well. You got the invites from her as well. You can always you know, pop those questions over to her. But I'll kind of pause for a moment here and see if any other questions before we close out. Okay, so no questions now. Uh, in that case, I'll get you folks back to your afternoon or morning. Uh, I want to thank you again for joining us today. Again, first time doing one of these uh, as far as the webinar series is concerned. We're going to kind of keep working on our process, streamlining things. Hopefully, you got some information today, um, which is beneficial for you. And if you have any questions you want to follow up with us on, by all means, feel free to reach out. Um, we don't charge talk, so I want you guys to feel comfortable in asking anything and everything you want to ask. Um, thank you again for your time today, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.